Welcome to NASA's Digital Learning Network Summer of Innovation special webcast series featuring the following topics every Tuesday and Thursday through August. Mother Earth, Father Sky, Rocketry, Life Science, the Universe, Aeronautics, and Robotics. I'm your host, Karen Long, and our guests today are going to be speaking to us on the topic of aeronautics. From Dryden Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base in California, DLN coordinator David Alexander and his special guests. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Karen. How's things going with you? Oh, things are great here at Langley. So glad that you're joining us today. And before we Thank begin, you. before we begin, I'd like to remind our audience that if they'd like to email questions to you during the presentation, feel free to do that by emailing us at nasalearn at gmail.com. That's nasalearn at gmail.com. And now, without further hesitation, on to you, David. Thank you very much, Karen. NASA Dryden is one of 10 of our nation's centers which rely on the ingenuity, creativity, and problem-solving skills of its hard workers rooted in a deep historical foundation. It is where the cry of team spirit and the desire to answer scientific questions happen, not only for the engineering communities, but for our nation's people. Today, it is with great pleasure I introduce to you Dr. Greg Bendrick, NASA's chief flight surgeon. He will talk about his contributions and success in his career here at Dryden. Thanks, Dave. As mentioned, I'm Greg Bendrick, Dr. Greg Bendrick. People call me Doc. I'm the chief flight surgeon here at NASA Dryden Flight Research Center, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity today to talk to you about what it is that a flight surgeon does and what, in fact, uh, aerospace medicine is. Uh, what is flight medicine? Uh, by way of a little bit of background, to kind of let you know where I've come from and some of, some of what it took to, to get to this position, uh, just run through uh, when I was uh, went to grade school. I decided that I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't know exactly what type of doctor I was going to be, but I figured that's what, where I wanted to go. So I did my four years of high school, and then applied to college. Did my four years of uh, college and got my degree, my bachelor's degree, uh, what they call the undergraduate degree. I uh, was accepted into medical school and went to four years of medical school uh, after my four years of college. At that point, then, uh, most med graduating medical students will choose a specialty of some sort that they will then pursue training in and become a specialist, uh, like a pediatrician or an internist uh, or uh, maybe a, a cardiologist or a neurologist, something like that. Well, I decided that I wanted to pursue flight medicine, uh, which is, in fact, a specialty like these other specialties. So I joined the Air Force, and after some doing some time overseas, uh, working as a general doctor, uh, pursued training in the residency in aerospace medicine through the U.S. Air Force down at Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio. That was a total of four years, and then after that, I was a, a graduated specialist uh, in aerospace medicine. Uh, after I finished my career with the Air Force, I then came over here to NASA uh, in uh, 2001, and I've been here ever since and really, really uh, enjoy the privilege of working with NASA and with working with very, very creative people, very good problem solvers, people that just love a challenge and love working through a problem and getting through it. So hopefully that helps clarify a little bit or explain a little bit about where I've come from and how I got to where I am. Now let's talk about a little bit about what it is that a flight surgeon does and what is, in fact, aerospace medicine. All of you, I'm sure, have probably been sick at some point. Uh, you've, you've, you've gotten sick, maybe thrown up, or uh, have a tummy ache, or a headache, or coughing a lot, and you, 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 your parents bring you to the doctor, or you, you get brought to the doctor by your teacher, and uh, they check you out. They may have to give you a shot or draw some blood for, for some tests, and they usually give you some, a, a prescription for some medicine, which maybe not, doesn't taste all that well, but hopefully it works and you get better and life is good and you get back to your school work and playing and all that other good stuff. But what flight surgeons do and what aerospace medicine does is preventive medicine. We're actually 
uh, given our board certification through the American Board of Preventive Medicine, and we deal with trying to prevent problems from happening before they develop. So as you can see here, we do deal with the clinical and preventive medical requirements of humans in atmospheric flight and in space. What does that mean? Well, as I mentioned, if you're sick and you go to the doctor, the doctor is focused on this particular problem, particular disease, and how do we make you better? What flight surgeons do is we take normal pilots, and they're going to be exposed to the abnormal environment of air and space. And we'll talk about what some of those things are here in a minute and make sure that they can deal okay with those stresses, if you want to call it, of air and space flight so that they don't have any undue or bad side effects as a result of that uh, that can, in some cases, uh, actually wind up in death. It's, it's pretty, pretty serious. So we take normal people and help prevent problems from happening when they go into the abnormal environment of air and space. And that's pretty much what flight surgeons do in a nutshell. One of the things we do specifically with regard to that job, in addition to doing exams on the pilots, uh, we'll do vision tests and hearing tests and tests of their heart and things like that to make sure that they're okay, make sure nothing really bad is going on. But one of the other things that the flight surgeon does will actually we're required to fly with the pilots uh, in the back seats, typically, of the fighter jets, which is kind of cool. It's kind of fun. Uh, we'll put on the G-suit and the parachute, and we'll talk about some of that here in a minute. Put on the helmet like this. We'll talk about more about this in a minute, particularly with the oxygen mask. And we go, and uh, the pilot will take us up, and we'll fly around, maybe do some spins, or go through some of the other stresses that the pilot will encounter during flight. And why is this? Well, it's not just so that the flight surgeon can have fun, although that is a good side effect of it, uh, but it's because the flight surgeon has to understand what the pilot faces when they fly the airplane. And we'll talk about some of those specific problems here in a minute. That's one of the nicest aspects about my job is about once a week, I, I have to get out of the office, get out of the clinic, go out to the flight line and fly uh, with the, one of the pilots for a little while uh, in one of the airplanes. And that, that's really one of the, the, the privileges of, of working at, at a place like NASA. It really is really uh, a truly unique experience. We take care of the individual, the pilot, who's physiologically normal but works in an abnormal, sometimes hostile environment of flight, in atmospheric flight or in space. So what are, we, what are some of these problems? What, are, what makes it so hostile? One of the things is lack of oxygen. When you go up in altitude, the pressure of the air decreases. And that means the pressure of the oxygen decreases. And when you get much above 10,000 feet above sea level, you can have really, really serious uh, lowered levels of oxygen. And that can be a problem for the pilot to function appropriately or normally. One of the ways we deal with that is by having the, oxygen, having the pilot wear an oxygen mask that will provide oxygen to him or her while they're flying at these higher altitudes. One example, as I mentioned earlier, is the helmet that we have here, a NASA uh, pilot helmet. This isn't a type of helmet that you would wear in space, but this is one of the helmets that our pilots who fly airplanes wear uh, as part of our aeronautics mission here at NASA. As you can see, in addition to protecting the head, in case there, there's a, a hard landing or an unusual turn of events in the aircraft, we also have an oxygen mask that would fit across the front of the face, be latched up here onto the side, and to provide high levels of oxygen, sometimes under pressure to the pilot through this hose, which is then connected to the oxygen supply from the airplane. This is one of the things that uh, the Air Force and the early stages of NASA and some other uh, federal agencies have developed to provide that, a very crucial supply of oxygen to the pilot while they're in flight. Now, all of you, I'm sure, have probably ridden on an airplane, commercial airplane, going from one place to another, and you notice that you don't have to wear oxygens and, uh, oxygen masks when you fly, and that's because on the commercial airplanes, the, the cabins are pressurized. Uh, now, they're not pressurized to sea level but they are pressurized to the equivalent altitude of about 6,000 feet or so, five to 6,000 feet in most airplanes. So even though the airplane itself is flying at a much higher altitude, say 35 or 39,000 feet, 
inside the cab and you feel like it's only about 6,000 feet and you're able to breathe normally and do fine with that. However, if there's a problem with the cabin pressurization system or if they have a leak or something like that or a mechanical failure, then as the flight attendants will brief you, the oxygen masks will fall down from usually from the top of the airplane and you'll need to wear those until they can get to a safer altitude. That's why oxygen levels and specifically hypoxia, which means low oxygen level, is such a, uh, a worrisome thing because if you don't have enough oxygen, you don't function very well and that can actually be, be very, very dangerous. Here's just a slide that shows some of the layers of the, or levels of the atmosphere. We break them up into layers. These aren't real hard and fast and there is some transition from one layer to another, but the closest layer would be the troposphere. That's where all your weather and your water vapor occurs. There's a transition layer we call the tropopause and then you go up to the very higher levels, the stratosphere, where there's very little oxygen, it's very cold up there. And uh, the, the, the people that fly in those areas need special protection if, in fact, their cabin isn't pressurized. One of the things that we do with the pilots to make sure that they're able to recognize if the, they don't, they're not getting enough oxygen is run them through uh, an altitude chamber. It's difficult to do a lot of tests uh, with pilots up in the air because you may not have a real big airplane to work with. And likewise, if you're doing tests in the air, that might be dangerous uh, to yourself and to the pilots and whoever else might be with you. So we simulate that environment in a chamber, a special room on the ground. And in this case, the altitude chamber, otherwise known as a hypobaric chamber, meaning low air pressure, hypobaric, we bring people into this chamber, in this special room, we pump out the air to a specific level, and we may have them test uh, off the oxygen mask to see what their symptoms of oxygen deprivation are, what their symptoms of hypoxia are. That way, if they feel these same symptoms while they're flying the airplane, they'll know, wait, there's a leak here, there's something going on. I don't know what it is, but the first thing I'm going to do is put on my oxygen mask, and then we'll figure out and troubleshoot the problem. I have a little video here. This is actually from an old movie, but it's still relevant, showing the flight surgeon uh, bringing in some pilots into an altitude chamber and doing some tests uh, with them in the chamber. The guy in the white coat there is the, is the flight surgeon, and these other gentlemen are Navy aviators, naval aviators, uh, pilots flying naval airplanes. And there's the air medical technician closing the door to seal it up so we can start to pump out the air. And there's the pump that'll pump out the air, and you can see the altitude starts going up, the simulated altitude inside the uh, altitude chamber. Now these pilots are going to be doing simulated tests, simulating flying the airplane, while the atmosphere inside is being simulated to be at higher altitudes, 8, 9, 10, 11,000 feet. And the flight surgeon is assessing their performance on how well they're able to fly the airplane based on where those lights are turning on and off uh, in relation to how the, the oxygen levels are being decreased. Uh, one of the things you might also be doing would be to see whether their heart and their lungs are functioning okay in those situations. Another problem that we get into when we go up into the higher altitudes with the lower pressure is that of trapped air. And as you may or may not know, when you get lower pressure, the volume of your air tends to increase. So if you had a balloon that was only half filled when you were on the ground and you went up to the top of a mountain uh, at, say, 10,000 feet, that balloon would be much bigger because there's less pressure but the higher altitude. Same way with the gas that's inside various cavities in the body, like your middle ear, or the sinuses in the, in the skull and face, uh, cheekbones, uh, or even the, uh, the gas that's inside your, your stomach and your gastrointestinal tract. Uh, that gas tends to expand when you go up into the higher altitudes with the lower pressure, and that can sometimes cause problems. We call that either ear block or sinus block, uh, or sometimes gas gets trapped in the intestines of your stomach and they can cause so much pain that it can be very distracting and, in fact, incapacitating to the pilot. And if that happens while they're flying the airplane, obviously that can be a problem and a threat to the safety of flight. 
So we take that very seriously and make sure that pilots can in fact clear their ears, pop their ears so to speak, uh, before they go fly and make sure that a, a, a cold or allergies or something like that isn't keeping them from doing that. Likewise, we assess them before flight to make sure that they haven't got a sinus infection, which may lead to a sinus block due to expanding gas trapped within the sinuses of the cheekbones or up in the forehead. So those are some of the things that the flight surgeon will do beforehand uh, for the pilot to make sure that they don't, he or she doesn't have a problem when they fly. Uh, before I go on to decompression sickness, I'm going to go back one slide, and I have a question for you all to think about. If you have the answer, feel free to email it in here uh, at the uh, email address that they, that they showed you. But I've got a question. When you go up in a commercial airplane, you probably notice that your ears pop as you went up in altitude. As I mentioned, that's because the inside of the aircraft is pressurized only to about 6,000 feet. Now, my question is, if you were in the space shuttle and you were going all the way out into space, would your ears pop on the way out into space? Think about that. If you have the answer, feel free to email it to us, and, but more importantly, email the justification or the reason why you think your ears would or would not pop when you go on the space shuttle up into space. Anyway, think about that. My next uh, thing I wanted to talk about was a problem that we sometimes see in the air crew in flight, and that is something called decompression sickness. What decompression sickness is, is what you feel when the nitrogen that's dissolved in your blood and in the fluids of the body does, uh, comes out of solution and forms bubbles. And we see this happening when the pressure around you gets less. Very interesting. We never really, and I say we, the, the flight surgeons of years gone by never really knew what this was. They called it altitude sickness or sometimes they called it the bends uh, because sometimes after pilots got done flying and they got out of the airplane, they would walk bent over because they couldn't straighten up. It hurt too bad. We now know that that's because the nitrogen that's dissolved in your blood and in your fluids of your body will actually come out of solution and form bubbles. And this will form bubbles in your blood and these bubbles can get lodged in your joints or they can get lodged in other parts like your spinal cord or even in your brain. And that's when it becomes very, very serious is when you have the nitrogen bubbles, the decompression sickness that involves the brain. And these can be very, very significant events and very serious events that require the treatment by a flight surgeon. And one of the ways we would treat that would be in a, what we call a diving chamber or a hyperbaric chamber. Remember, the altitude chamber was a hypobaric chamber, but the diving chamber is a hyperbaric chamber because we're increasing the pressure. And that's one of the treatments for the decompression sickness, is to increase the pressure, and for periods of time we'll have the individual breathe pure oxygen, 100% oxygen, which will help dissolve or break up the bubbles and return them back to normal. That, pick, that hyperbaric chamber there is one that from Brooks Air Force Base, uh, where I did my residency, my specialty training in aerospace medicine. There's the air medical technician there who would work with all the valves there w with the chamber. And during its treatment, either he or another air medical technician would go in with the individual into that chamber, and we would increase the pressure for certain periods of time. In certain periods of time, they would breathe 100% oxygen, and that would hopefully take care of their decompression sickness and get them back to normal. Another problem we encounter in flight is that of G-force. Uh, now, you've all probably experienced or you can imagine a situation where you're holding a bucket of water. Now, if you take that, that bucket of water and you spin it quickly around yourself so that the bucket, the water is being pushed to the bottom of the bucket as you spin it, that water won't actually spill out of it, and it'll remain perfectly dry. And the reason for that is something called centrifugal force. The, the, when you go into that motion, the force pushing outward of that water keeps the water inside the bucket. Well, you can experience the same thing when flying a high-performance airplane. When you turn very quickly in a very tight turn in the airplane, that's acting like the bucket with the water being pushed to the bottom, only in this case, it's the blood inside the pilot's body that's being pushed to the bottom. 
uh, to, to his bottom and to his legs and down to his feet. And that's a problem because then it's being pushed out of the brain. And when, the, when you're not getting enough blood flow to the brain, then you can lose consciousness or you can have other problems in terms of being able to safely operate the airplane. When you lose consciousness, we call that G-induced loss of consciousness or G-lock. And that's one of the, the problems that flight surgeons have been dealing with for many years. In the early days, it was called pilot blackout. But now we refer to it as G-lock, G-induced loss of consciousness. And there's several different countermeasures that we've used over the years, one of which you may be familiar with is the G-suit, which is a, like a pair of trousers with a bunch of air sacs in them. And the pilot wears these, and when the airplane starts to make its tight turn, air uh, gas from, from the airplane will be automatically be pumped into those air sacs to squeeze the legs, squeeze the thighs, and nowadays to actually squeeze part of the abdomen to keep the blood from pooling down into the lower extremities and keep the blood up in the chest and up in the brain where the pilot needs it. That's one of the things that flight surgeons and life support technicians and uh, other engineers have contributed to the progress of safe flight through the years. One of the things that uh, I'm proud to say NASA has been a part of uh, during, during that time. So that's the G-forces. Uh, as I mentioned, you can sometimes see various symptoms uh, before you get to the G-induced loss of consciousness. You might see gray out. Uh, you might see uh, before uh, total blackout. In some special circumstances, you can go straight to blackout without graying out. And that's actually very dangerous, one of the things that, that's most concerning. Also, when you pull Gs, this puts a, a very high stress load on the heart. And so the flight surgeon has to make sure that the pilot's heart and their lungs are doing okay, but in particular their heart, so that the, we know that the heart can deal with that stress and pump against it while they're encountering those Gs. One of the ways we help train the pilots and also to test the pilots is in something called the centrifuge, uh, the human centrifuge. And here we see a picture of one uh, from uh, Pennsylvania, a famous one. It's been used for many, much throughout the years. And in that ball there on the end of the, the metal arm would be uh, the pilot or the pilot candidate sitting, and that whole assembly would spin around, and that would simulate the centrifugal force or the Gs that the pilot would then encounter. One of the things the flight surgeons do is help the pilot contract their legs and their thighs and their abdomen in a very particular way to keep the blood, again, from pooling down into their lower extremities and keep it up into the uh, chest and into the brain where, the, where they need it. And a very controlled, disciplined breathing in, in terms of doing that to, to help withstand those high Gs, the high centrifugal force. One of the very interesting things about high-performance flight that we may not always encounter in the commercial airplane flight, uh, which, uh, again, makes working at NASA a very unique and, uh, uh, and privileged opportunity. I am really, really glad that we have this opportunity to do that. Another problem we encounter is that of spatial disorientation. And this is where you get confused as to where you are or, or which way is up. And what this uh, a, a way of, 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 of explaining where you may see this in uh, your normal life or in a non-flying uh, environment is something we call the dizzy bat game. And if you, in the dizzy bat game, if you were to take the bat and put it down on the ground with your, and put your forehead on the bat and you go kind of around in circles there four or five times, and then you stand up and you run toward a target, I can guarantee you, you're going to fall down. You're not going to make the target. And that's because in your inner ear, the vestibular apparatus of your inner ear gets confused. There's actually some fluid in there, and when you go around in a circle several times, that fluid gets turning, and then when you stand up, the fluid is still turning, and when you try to run, that throws you off balance. And that's a very simple example on the ground of what occurs in the air uh, in a much more complicated and sometimes much more dangerous situation. The pilots uh, can get into spins, and then when they come out of the spins, their vestibular apparatus can still be very, very confused, and it can make it very difficult to fly the airplane safely. So that's one of the things that the, the flight surgeons helps the pilots deal with in terms of making sure, first of all, their vestibular apparatus is okay and ready for flight, and then helping them to deal with those problems once they encounter them in flight or training for those. 
We call that sometimes seat of the pants uh, training, and uh, although I don't have a video for this particular one, uh, we use what was what's sometimes called a barony chair, where we put the pilot in the chair and spin them around, and then have them either bend over or lean back with their head, and we can see various disorientating effects uh, as a result of that. One of the training procedures that the flight surgeon will sometimes do. Here's a, I got a short video here that shows some of the other tests that the flight surgeons will do. Uh, this is a whole vibration test to uh, make sure that the pilots can operate uh, efficiently and uh, smoothly in a vibrating aircraft. This is a, with, to assess whether they can operate uh, effectively while the aircraft is spinning. These are some of the tests for the early astronauts before in the early Mercury program before they went into space. There's the centrifuge dealing with the G-forces that the pilots would encounter there. And there's a test where we're looking at the uh, status of the heart and the lungs, the cardiovascular status, to see if that, to make sure that it's okay for them to tolerate the, the stresses of the centrifugal force. So, the, I have a question here. Uh, this is an answer to one of the que to the question that I asked earlier about do your ears pop when you go into space? The answer is I don't think one's ears would pop while traveling on the space shuttle because the orbiter is absolutely airtight. Because even a small leak would be dangerous in space while the pressure is not as terribly great between the airplane and the surrounding air. And that was from Aaron. And you know what, Aaron? You are exactly right. That is a great answer that shows a lot of really good insight. Uh, without getting too technical, the airplanes have what we call a differential pressure system where they have a valve and they pump air into the plane while air is being also released from the airplane to keep a certain pressure differential. And that's because we know that the airplane will always be flying through the air and will have at least some air pressure out there that we can use to pump inside the airplane. The shuttle, the orbiter as you mentioned, is absolutely airtight. It must be absolutely airtight. There is no cabin differential because when you're in space, for all intents and purposes, you're at zero pressure outside the orbiter or the capsule in space. And you're absolutely right, even a small leak could be very dangerous up there. So the uh, orbiter has what we call a sealed cabin approach where they carry all their own oxygen and nitrogen and that some of that is regenerated during the flight and that it keeps it at a particular pressure. In fact, that pressure is uh, the pressure of sea level, 14.7 pounds per square inch or 760 millimeters of mercury uh, pressure inside there. So in fact your ears would not pop when you go into space because you're at that, you maintain that constant C pressure. So thank you Aaron, that was a great answer and shows a lot of really good insight. So moving along, speaking of space, there are some unique aspects of space uh, that the flight surgeons have to deal with, uh, working with the astronaut corps and with many other people, mainly at the Johnson Space Center and Kennedy Space Center. Some of the things we deal with are zero gravity. And as you may know, we don't really have zero gravity because there's always going to be a very small gravitational component uh, to the Earth, to the Moon, to the Sun, to the other planets. But we call it microgravity because it's a very, very small component. So again, for all intents and purposes, it's zero gravity, and the issues on the human body uh, can be very serious, particularly in the long run. We get space motion sickness. Uh, when we go into space, the vestibular apparatus, uh, you know, it, it's used to, to walking in the gravitational force of Earth, the 1G environment, as we call it. And when you get into a more or less zero-G environment or a micro-G environment, then the vestibular apparatus gets confused. And since it's not normally that way, the, the, the body thinks, the brain tends to think that you may be sick or that you've ingested some sort of a poison. So what it wants to do is get rid of that poison. So people can sometimes get very nauseous and can even throw up when they go into space. And that can be really, really bad if you're wearing a spacesuit with a helmet and the visors down and you throw up, but we won't go there too much. The, uh, uh, normally after a couple days in space though, those symptoms go away and the body in fact adapts to that and that's a very good thing. The heart can get 
deconditioned. It can get a little bit weak because it's not having to pump against the gravity of Earth. So the heart can get weak, and the longer you're in space, the weaker it can get. And that can be a problem then when you come back to Earth, and your heart then has to pump against the force of the gravity on Earth. That's why it's very important to make sure that the heart condition is in good or more or less top-notch condition before they go into space because it, 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 the weightlessness of space uh, can decondition the heart significantly. The brain and the inner ear, as we mentioned, uh, can be a problem in terms of uh, uh, keeping your balance. There is no gravity, so you don't know really which way is up. And that can be very confusing and can contribute to the supposed motion sickness, as we mentioned. Likewise, because there is no gravity and you, you don't have to force yourself to walk against the, or run against the, the 1G gravity of, of Earth, the muscles can get weak and the bones can get weak. You can lose calcium from the bones. And the longer you're in space, the, the worse this gets. One of the countermeasures that we use, of course, is for astronauts to exercise in space. Either use the treadmill or the riding bicycle or sometimes there's a rowing machine. And that definitely helps, but there's only so much exercise you can do in space. You can't exercise 24 hours a day. So even for the long duration astronauts who do a lot of exercise while they're in space, they have significant uh, deconditioning of the muscles and the bones when they come back to Earth and it requires some period of time for them to adjust back to Earth's gravity. And that's a serious issue if we're going to go to Mars because you're going to be spending uh, several months in space and then walking on the Martian surface and then several months in the microgravity of space before you come back to Earth. So we still got some challenges ahead in terms of helping people deal with the weightlessness of space and we would definitely benefit from the ideas and the creativity of young people such as yourself in the years to come in tackling some of these issues, believe me. Finally, there's the mental health issues. Uh, the, we have several people in a relatively small uh, uh, orbiter or environment of space on the space station. Sometimes they're from different cultures and vastly different backgrounds. Uh, their original languages may not always have been the same. Uh, people that were born in Russia speak Russian typically before they learned English. And so sometimes this can be very uh, stressful psychologically and can even lead to some disagreements and arguments from time to time. I think we've all experienced this just going on a family vacation or a camping trip together and share, you know, riding in the car or sharing a tent or a, a recreational vehicle. We can sometimes get on each other's nerves. And those can be issues in space, too. Uh, astronauts are humans, like all of us, and they can sometimes uh, get, get angry or, or irritated with one another. But fortunately, by working with the flight surgeons and with other psychologists, uh, we can help uh, decrease some of those problems and have everybody work together in a good team spirit. And we have another question uh, here. from uh, This one is from uh, Jared. Uh, this is, what are some of the procedures that pilots take when having a health issue in mid-flight, like hypoxia or blood loss to the brain? Or are there any procedures to take? Uh, Jared, good question. Uh, yes, there are some procedures to take, and that's where the flight surgeons come in. Uh, first of all, we help with the life support te technicians, uh, help the pilot to, to recognize these problems before they develop, and go through emergency, what we call emergency procedures, or EPs. So if they suspect that they're having a hypoxia problem, the first thing they do is what we call gang load the oxygen regulator. Basically, they turn up all the oxygen to 100%, and uh, pressurized oxygen if they've got it. Uh, and hopefully that'll help resolve the issue and then they can troubleshoot where the problem is if there's a leak or something else. Uh, if that doesn't work, then they immediately, uh, before they lose consciousness from the hypoxia, go down to a lower altitude and to a safer altitude so that they can get higher pressure and better oxygen to breathe. For the blood loss to the brain when they're going through the G maneuvers, this, this, the high centrifugal force maneuvers, they're uh, doing the training maneuvers, like I said, of squeezing the legs and the arms. If they feel the G's coming on, they can release the G's if they're still in control of the airplane and have some of that force come off of them so that their heart can function more effectively. In some cases where they actually pass out, NASA, in fact, at NASA Dryden, we've been working on some technology uh, that 
will, where the computers will recognize that the airplane is headed toward the ground and there is no pilot input and will automatically take control of the aircraft, fly it away from the ground to a safe altitude, straight and level, and then when the pilot recovers, they can take over again. So again, one of the fundamental flight research things that we're doing at Dryden to help <coughs> make flight safer in these higher performance aircrafts. So good question, Jared. I hope that answered it uh, to your satisfaction. Anyway, uh, moving along with the space medicine uh, landing procedures, uh, finally, to wrap things up, the flight surgeons get very involved after the shuttle lands. And this is a picture of the shuttle landing out here at Edwards Air Force Base, which is where NASA Dryden is located. As you may know, the shuttle normally lands in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center, but when the weather is not very good there and they've got thunderstorms moving through the area, then of course they will land out here at uh, Edwards Air Force Base at NASA Dryden Flight Research Center. Uh, normally we're, we're not specifically involved with space flight, although we do have some projects, but we deal, as was mentioned, with aeronautics, with the aviation, with airplanes, and doing fundamental research with airplanes. But having said all that, when the shuttle can't land on the East Coast, it'll come here and we'll take care of them. And that's where the flight surgeons come in. After they come off the shuttle, if they're sick or if there's an injury, the flight surgeons will work with them to get them off the shuttle uh, safely, put them on a gurney, uh, and then typically we'll put them on a, a helicopter rather than a ground ambulance and fly them to the hospital where we'll then help work with their doctors to coordinate care. This slide shows some pictures of my colleagues from the Air Force side during a recent exercise where we had some uh, simulated astronauts. Uh, we helped extract from the orbiter, put it on a gurney, and then got them onto the helicopter and actually flew them down to the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles. It was, it was quite an experience. And again, it's one of the things that flight surgeons do uh, that uh, my uh, colleagues uh, working in other specialties may not be uh, exposed to from day to day. Uh, one, again, one of the privileges of working uh, here at uh, NASA. Uh, that concludes my formal talk. I have uh, one uh, question, again, from Aaron. Uh, what's the worst sickness or illness that has had to be treated during a space mission? <laughs> well, that's a that's a good that's a very good question. Uh, the uh, uh, it uh, and I laugh because we've we've had some some problems like where where uh, astronauts would would throw up in space and stuff, and they don't usually don't like to talk about it. They don't like it to go onto the news, uh, but it happens to everybody. Uh, but the, uh, in, in during a, a, a space mission. Uh, one of the things that uh, comes to mind is, uh, I'm thinking here of one of the worst things. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is when the uh, astronauts were uh, on the moon in the Apollo uh, 14 uh, mission, I believe, or Apollo 15, when they were walking on the moon, uh, one of the astronauts was having some unusual uh, heartbeats, what we call bigeminy, uh, a skipped heartbeat every time the heart, heart was beating. And uh, at first, the flight surgeons didn't know what that was all about, whether there was a disease of the heart or whether it was due to the radiation of space or whether it was due to the, to the lower gravity of space or whether there was some other issue involved. Well, after careful analysis afterwards, we uh, realized that uh, one of the problems that can lead to this is low potassium level. And it turned out that in the pilot food, at that point, they were using the tube food that looked like toothpaste they would eat through the helmet, uh, that that food mixture actually didn't have enough potassium in it. Uh, we thought that it had enough, but it turned out that their uh, body work and their exertion used up more potassium than we initially had accounted for. So that was a learning experience to, to know then that we had to have more potassium in the astronaut food uh, after that. And that astronaut did well, uh, but at the time it was a very serious condition because we didn't know basically whether they were going to have a, a heart attack or, or not uh, there on the, on the surface of the moon. And obviously that would be a very serious problem if that were to occur. But uh, one of the take-home points for that is that uh, you need to eat your potassium, uh, particularly like in bananas. Bananas are a good thing. So, you know, if they're good enough for astronauts, I'm sure they're good enough for you. Anyway, uh, good question, Aaron. I appreciate that. And uh, 
uh, uh, my colleagues at Johnson Space Center may have a different answer to that particular question about what's the, the worst illness that has had to tr be treated during a, a space mission, uh, but uh, I'll defer to them at a later time on that. In any case, I hope this was uh, helpful to you. I hope it was uh, educational, that you learned something. And I also hope that maybe even you had a little bit of fun and that was uh, 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 engaging and uh, maybe a little bit entertaining for you. Uh, and I appreciate your attention. I appreciate the questions. And that concludes my talk, and we'll send it back to you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Greg and David, for sharing with us today. And thank all of you for joining our webcast. Join us next Tuesday, August 3rd at 11 a.m. Eastern for our next featured speaker from March Marshall Space Flight Center. It will be aerospace engineer Tristan Curry, focusing on the early history, development, and future of rocket propulsion. Now stay with us for Headline News to learn more about what NASA education is doing for students and teachers. Have a great day, everyone.